Hello Soundies. Welcome to our Sound for Video session. Hope everyone's doing well out there. Uh, we have a story to tell here for you today. Um, we are working on our second backup. So the ATEM failed again right before we went live. Uh, the encoder, that is, on the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO. Um, I switched over to an ATEM Mini Pro. It also failed. So I wonder if there's something in my router that doesn't like the ATEMs at this point, which is weird because it was always fine before. And then now we're using, um, we're still using the ATEM Mini Extreme as a switcher, as a, and then that goes in USB into the computer, and that's going, uh, being streamed out through Ecamm Live. So that's where we're at right now. So we had our double backup strategy in place, and it seems like it, <laughs> it's working reasonably well. All right, let's go to our agenda and we'll take a look at uh, what we're going to do today. So first up today, we are going to take a look at some new shotgun microphones from Rycote. Rycote is best known actually for their shock mounts for, and uh, they have a boom pole quick release. They have uh, the big covers, the Zeppelin style covers, um, Lots of things like that, and now they have a couple of shotgun microphones, so we'll take a closer look at that in just a minute. We have one question that was submitted ahead of time, and then we'll go to the chat as well. So let's first up go over to our overhead cam. We'll take a look at these microphones here. All right, um, so these come in this, uh, this it's like a really high-density plastic box, but I have the, there's a short version, which is the HC15, and then there's also a larger version. You can see it also picks up my fingerprints pretty nicely. <laughs> um, so here's the longer shotgun microphone, and this is the HC22, it looks like. Um, interesting design. It's a, So I would call this a... Sh uh, nowadays, I guess we're calling these medium shotgun microphones, and we're calling the shorter, even shorter ones sh short shotgun? I'm not, I don't know. The, the whole world has kind of been turned upside down in terms of how they... Are doing these nowadays but for comparison let me pull out my sennheiser mkh416 so you can see what that looks like as a comparison because this is kind of what i would traditionally call a medium shotgun microphone so here's the sennheiser mkh416 uh, probably an inch and a half longer maybe five centimeters is my guess there 
So just for comparison's sake, um, let me just also take a look on the computer here really quickly. I wanted to take, let's switch on over to the Mac. There we go. All right, so um, there are microphones here. Um, I don't know what's, uh, <laughs> I haven't done a lot of research on these yet, and we're going to do a full review, but I wanted to just do uh, some sample audio for now. But we have what they're calling a short shotgun microphone and a shotgun microphone. Um, they kept things simple. From, the, from that standpoint, yes, things are pretty simple here. No high pass filter, no high frequency boost on these, just a microphone with an XLR connector. And they can, they can, we'll listen to it in just a moment here, but they say they sound precise. Um, so we'll see what that sounds like in practical terms. So they're both hypercardioid in terms of their polar pattern. They're back electric, elect, electric condensers. So they're pre-polarized basically. Um, self noise is coming in at 8.5 dBA weighted, which is uh, pretty, pretty good actually for a shotgun microphone. Uh, max SPL is 133 dB. Signal and noise 85 dB, uh, require phantom power. They're 19 millimeters in diameter. And you can see their lengths here. So 15.5 centimeters and 22.1 centimeters. Coming in, in in terms of weight at 90 and 100 grams um, respectively. So let's, uh, let's go ahead and switch back to our uh, overhead for just a moment here. I actually have let me move these out of the way here. So the boxes, getting those out of the way. This is a little out of focus here, but I just wanted you to see. So I have this mounted up right now. Um, in this case, it's actually on the Elgato Wave Low Profile Boom Arm. We'll do a review of that here. You can see there's a little bit of that right there. But I also have it on the Rycote Nano. Uh, what's it called? The Windshield Nano, I think. Um, they have a new windshield as well. It is called the Nano Shield. Um, so this is the shock mount that comes with that, and uh, it's on the, the Rycoat quick release system here, which you can kind of see if I turn this sideways here. So the idea here is I can pull on this and quick release and pop that back on for now. All right, so let's go back to our main camera and let's get you an audio sample. This is the short version that I have up on the mic right now, or up on the stand right now. And so what I'm going to do, ooh, that's awkward. We're getting all twisted up here, so let me come around. Okay. These are both running through the sound, uh, the, sorry, not the sound devices, through the Allen & Heath SQ5. Let me just get this one aimed up about right. Okay, I'm gonna switch over to this one now. Okay, we are now on the Rycoat. This is the short shotgun microphone. And uh, this is what that one sounds like. I do have the foam cover on the front of, or the top of it. And uh, no compressor, make sure here. No compressor, no EQ, just double checking on the mixer here. So this is what this sounds like. There is a high pass filter. Let me turn that off as well. Okay, this is it, totally raw. In the room here, we do have the fan from the ATEM is spinning and the camera has a fan as well. So you may pick up a little bit of that. Um, those are both generally to the rear of the microphone. Let me just move this out a little bit to get away from them and I can reposition this a little bit. Okay, there we go. So this is the short shotgun microphone, the HC15, I believe it's called. Again, this is a hyper, or sorry, a, they called it super, no, they're calling it hypercardioid actually, in this case here on the documentation. This is what I'm looking at now. Um, does look like there's a little bit of a presence boost starting at about 2,500K. So 2 point, sorry, 2.5K. Um, and so it goes up about two or three dB and that sustains basically through 
the sibilance range generally <laughs> um, it, it drops back down by the time you get to 10k it's uh, it's back down to um, plus or minus zero db so um, in any case this is what this one sounds like so there's the short shotgun microphone from Rycote, and again we'll get some more details when I do a more in-depth review uh, full review in the coming weeks here all right I'm going to go ahead and mute this one and we're going to switch back over to our main mic and we will put the longer shotgun microphone on here and we'll listen to that as well so just one second okay so now I'm back on the main mic here we're going to pop this out I am excited about the nano shield um, having something a little bit lower profile smaller than the cyclone which I've been using as my primary windshield um, having something smaller will be nice to work with just because it's it's nice to have less weight and something that's less imposing for the talent up on a, a boom. So looking forward to working with that one. So here's the longer one now, the HC22. We will connect that up. Get it into the nano shield shock mount here. Okay, I'll put the foam cover on. Okay, we're gonna switch over. Okay, now we're on the HC22 here. I wanna get to about the typical operating distance, which is about right here. This is probably 40 centimeters. Are we getting some funny comments? Okay, good. <laughs> Um, so, oh, by the way, happy Halloween for those that celebrate Halloween. We have a uh, pincer is joined here today by a spider, and we also have our little pumpkin right over here. Um, this is the HC22. That is the new medium shotgun microphone. Oh, it's very cool. I just realized just now there is actually a high pass filter in the cabling for the shock mount, and right now it has a high pass filter on at 80 hertz. Let me go ahead and turn that off. Okay, so now we have no high pass filter. We'll go ahead and switch back to the other microphone as well. So there's an inline high pass filter. That's interesting. Um, I hadn't noticed that before, so learning some new things already. <laughs> um, that's kind of cool. I like that there's a high pass filter there. So if your microphone doesn't have one, like in the case of the HC22, then you've got an option there. Although 80 hertz is a little bit higher than I typically would like it. If I'd like to have a little more freedom to do something milder, but most uh, most good mixers will have that capability. So certainly the sound device is 888. Uh, MixPre uh, will have those at, uh, implemented in an analog way. So they'll actually do the filtering before you get to your analog to digital converter. The zoom recorders, I'm not sure. I wouldn't be surprised if they're actually doing that digitally instead of in an analog fashion. So that means that the analog con analog to digital converter has to convert things first, and then it applies a high pass filter, which is um, from my point of view, not ideal, but this is the HC22. So HC22 without a high pass filter, and um, I'm going to switch back over to the other mic, and we'll talk a little bit here. Here's some nice comments. Okay, we are now back on the SR314, the the Earthworks. All right, let's go ahead and take some uh, comments and see what people have to say about these microphones. I'm curious. Okay, so we have a comment that says the first one sounds nice. Uh, you can I'll... pop them in. Oh, right. Sorry. <laughs> okay, sounds nice from Michael. Thanks for that, Michael. Like it. Seems very sensible, sensitive. Okay, so this is all the first one. Holy sibilance, Batman. <laughs> Clipping slightly, though, in excitement. Okay, yeah, so I'd need to gain stage that a little bit more carefully, and I would be also using an, a limiter typically, but yes, good point, Jason. I think this is for the first one. Uh, Mark, sounds nice. Very low noise. Uh, seems very sensitive for that at that distance. Yeah, it does. It does put out a bit. We were at 41 dB of gain, just FYI, in the mixer, so that is quite a bit of sensitivity. 
Boulder Surfer, presence boost may help when the mics are further away, as is typical in recording situation versus where you usually position your usual EW mics. And that's a great point. And not only that, if, if you also have it in a wind cover, you're going, going to attenuate some of the higher frequencies as well. And so a lot of times they build that presence boost in a little bit. So how much are these mics? I have not even gotten that far. So give me one second here and we're going to check that right now. We'll go to our friends at B&H and see what they say here. Rycote HC22. Doesn't look like Rycote is being, those are being carried. Oh, it changed it to HX. Uh, $799 for the 22, the larger version, and the 15 is 779 so $20 less for the short version. So that's going to be more, from my point of view, the short will be if you're in a pretty tight space or if you want to put something on camera, you know, for scratch audio or, you know, for whatever reason you, read, you need something really small. So that's the main difference there. All right. Okay, we have some more. More. Let's keep going. Thanks, Linda. Jason, both seem to have that presence boost. Yes, I think you're right. That's they've. I think they've uh, voiced them similarly. Similarly, uh, Boulder Surfer. The longer mic seems a bit less sibilant. Interesting. Okay, we'll do some closer looking at that. Maybe. <laughs> and it it could be I was slightly at a slightly different distance. I don't think so, but possibly. Uh, let's see, will this two Rycote mics be a MKH-50 or 418 killer, or is it some budget alternative like Deity? Hmm. Uh, well, it's not an MKH-50. It's a shotgun microphone, unlike the MKH-50, so I don't think it's really competing with that. It's, I think it's probably closer to the 416, at least the, the HC-22. Um, is it a killer? I have no idea yet. <laughs> um, these are just the, the first samples that we're recording. I haven't had a chance to look at it very closely. It's smaller and it's lighter. That's nice. Um, we'll see how it holds up in terms of its overall off-axis rejection and coloration. Um, it's voicing. We'll do some side by you know, some A-B sampling on that for several different voices to see how it, it does. Um, those are the main things that we'll look at. So... More to come on that. Was really nice to see those low self noise figures. I agree. A lot of times on shotgun microphones, you're creeping up into the 12 dBA weighted range, and that gets a little bit annoying. Um, but yeah, these are pretty good on that front. Thanks, Camille. Camille, <laughs> trick or treat to you too. Happy Halloween. Sound speeds. I have a very serious question for you tonight. Will you be handing? Handing out full-sized candy bars or something raisins to trick-or-treaters. <laughs> um, what you what because you haven't had uh, the uh, the pleasure of visiting in person yet, Alan. Um, what you don't know is that we live out in the sticks, and so we don't get trick-or-treaters here. So, what we will be doing is we will be having our own very decadent dessert of some sort. Danny's looking at me like, oh, really? <laughs> so we're, we don't usually hand out candy because nobody comes to our door. So answer your question. Uh, Mark, do you think these will be uh, good indoors, close spaces without comb filter issues? Um, I would expect them to behave like any other uh, shotgun microphone indoors. So I don't want to overstate that issue. That issue doesn't happen very often. It, it's surprising when it does happen. Um, and it can happen, um, but it's usually when the mic is a little bit off axis. Um, so yeah, this is because it's a shotgun microphone design. It it is going to be uh, just as likely as many other shotgun microphones to experience that issue. I don't I don't run into that a lot. And if you especially if you're if you have your microphone aimed correctly, and you're managing the reverb in your room, it's not generally an issue. So. Don't worry about it too much. It's mainly aim of the microphone that seems to make the biggest difference. So those are the things to keep in mind to answer that question. Oh, uh, water resistance. I haven't seen anything in regards to water resistance. So no, water and dust and wind are the 
enemies of microphones, and that is the case in in this this with this microphone as well. Um, they do say in terms of features. Let me just read a couple things here really quickly. Of course, compact design, ultra low noise circuitry, sophisticated RF shielding. So we'll do some RF testing as well. Low power consumption, gold plated Neutrik XLR connector. Tested against digital wireless systems and walkie-talkies, um, I assume for RF immunity. Preamp made from non-corrosive machined brass. Capsule interference tube made from lightweight machined aluminum. So that's interesting. So the they used a kind of a dual design. So the preamp itself is shielded by brass, which has, a, I think, better RF shielding capabilities than aluminum, but aluminum was used on the interference tube to keep the weight light, or keep it lightweight is my guess. Um, so that's kind of an interesting design. A lot of times you'll see the body made out of all one material. Um, so kind of interesting that they use two different materials. All right, anything else? All right, um, let me go ahead and mount the, the small one again so you can get a sample without the high pass filter because I missed that last time. So let's give me give me just a second here while we change this out. Um, the just a, in terms of initial impressions, this Elgato mic arm is actually pretty decent, better than I expected. I will say it's a ninety nine dollar mic arm. I was surprised. I put up a review of the Rode PSA One Plus a couple of weeks ago, and wow. I guess people are really into microphone arms. <laughs> I did not expect that uh, that many views on a microphone arm, or that many views on a microphone arm review. But indeed, it was a pretty popular one. So we'll be back with a review of this one. I like the low profile arms. That's what I use here. Uh, this is an OC white, but the uh, the wave is a lot less expensive. So it's ninety nine dollars as opposed to. 400 and some once you get everything for that setup. Okay, switching to the other microphone. Okay, we are on the HC15 right here. It's coming through okay, all right. Um, this time the high pass filter is turned off on the Rycote shock mount with its little connector here. So we should be getting the raw microphone, no high pass filter on the mixer, no EQ, no compression just raw microphone coming in straight through the signal chain. Um, she sells seashells by the seashore. Peter Piper picked a peck of purple pickled peppers. I think uh, hopefully that's given you a good sense for how this microphone sounds. What else can I tell you? Um, we did finally get the, we just, but right before the live stream started and the ATEM Mini Pro, any ATEM Mini Extreme ISOs, Encoder failed again. We got a picture. We got the documentation that Blackmagic asked us to provide. So very excited about that. So we're going to be able to get that information over them. I don't understand. It gets uh, things get funny when you have two ATEMs on the same network. And so I think maybe that's why this why we're having trouble with that. But hopefully with Ecamm Live, everything is coming through okay. All right, that is the HC15 with no filtering whatsoever. Switching back. Okay, we are back on the SR314. All right, well, let's go to back to our questions. We had one question submitted ahead of time, which was a good one. Uh, after the live stream, we had the hardware issue last Sunday. I did do a makeup session. I can't remember which night it was, one night this week, but it's available over on the Curtis Judd Audio channel if you're interested. So we did run through RX, uh, specifically Dialog Isolate, took a look at that. So you can go get a sample of what that does and what it's capable of. And Dialog Isolate, just FYI, is a that is an RX Advanced only feature, um, and they've improved it in RX Nine, so you can you can see what it's capable of and what it's not capable of yet. So there are some limitations. Let's jump into Etienne's question. He said, uh, after watching that, suppose you have mixed a short film for festivals at minus twenty four dB. No, well, it's not minus twenty four dB LUFS. It's just minus twenty four LUFS, and then you have to adjust the same mix for the internet around minus 16 LUFS. Do you start all your levels from scratch again, beginning with clip gains and track automation? Or do you simply raise your levels with Submaster or VCA tracks automation after duplicating your session? I may imagine you may also adjust compression of the Submaster tracks. 
Um, yes. So I think I would, um, it depends on how careful you want to be. And if you're, if you're working with a mastering engineer, I think the approach would be more sophisticated than if you're just quickly doing it yourself. But yes, if you mix something for a festival at minus 24 dB, excuse me, not, not minus 24 dB, minus 24 LUFS, then you should have your mix in a pretty solid state that you don't need to do a lot. You don't need to make a lot of changes. Um, so that's the first thing. So if I then had to go back and, and normalize it up to minus 16 LUFS for online, I would probably, if I have a really, really good mix, in most cases, I could probably just do some compression on the different buses and, and get things where I want them there and then normalize to minus 16. I mean, if you want to be really quick and dirty about it, you could just compress on the master bus and get it up to minus 16. That, and if, you, if your mix is really good, you might be able to pull that off. You just have to give it a try. But I don't think I would go in and I wouldn't probably remix it specifically for minus 16, but I would probably go in and um, take a look at the different buses. So I'd look at the dialogue bus, I'd look at the music bus, and I'd look at the sound effects bus. And then I would I would probably compress each of those appropriately to get them sounding right and give myself enough headroom to bump it up to minus 16. So hopefully um, that makes sense, Etienne. Good question. And I haven't done a lot of that, so <laughs> that would be my general approach. There are probably some re-recording mixers who might do that differently. I don't know. I'd like to get, I love, if any of you know a re-recording mixer that does that professionally full-time, I'd love to bring them in and have a talk about those kind of things and see how they generally approach that. So, all right, thanks for the question. Okay, let's go to the chat and see what we have going on in the chat today. What questions do you have for us? First up, from, and I, and I, I hope I'm saying this right, Honte. Do you know why low-end wireless systems use a 3.5 millimeter connector and higher-end use Limo or similar connectors? Why can't low-end use Limo and high-end use 3.5 millimeter connectors? Um, I, I think they can. Um, I think part of what you're seeing there is that the Limo connectors are probably more expensive, so that's one thing. Usually for the consumer, wireless, they're, what they're trying really hard to do is manage the overall cost of the device. So they will make all sorts of compromises to hit a price point. A lot of times, in fact, depending on the, the organization or the business, they actually identify a market first and a price first, and they aim for that price. And if they don't have a good sense that they can get this, um, that they can that they can hit that price point, they will actually abandon the project fairly early. Um, however, if they think they can, if the engineering group says, yeah, I think we can probably do it, then they, they go after it. So that's been my experience. Um, and that's that's probably my, that's my guess as to why you typically see that. Now, there are other things as well. On some of the higher end systems, they use uh, five pin limos. Uh, you can't do that on, a th well, there's no standard 3.5 millimeter five pole connector from the start. So that's one of the things. So I know, for example, the newer Electrosonics uses a five pin limo and um, just not something you can do with 3.5 millimeters. So um, the, I don't understand entirely their whole reasoning for using that five pin, but it does have um, five different connectors that they can use for various purposes. So that's another factor in that as well. My guess, if anyone knows better than that, please let us know in the chat. All right, from Manny, a little late on this question, but how's the Nano Shield kit? I have the Super Shield. How does it compare? Will you be reviewing it in the live stream? Uh, not in this live stream, no, but I will be putting together a review of the microphones along with the Nano Shield um, on my main YouTube channel, Curtis Judd. So that'll be here in the next few weeks. Thanks for the question, Manny. Sergio, has any of your students brought up the issue of vocal nodules in all the years you've been teaching? If so, is there anything worthwhile you can share? Um, I don't know. I, I think you need to go talk to a doctor in those cases. I don't, um, I haven't run into that, and I'm sure there are people that struggle with that as far as uh, vocalization, but I think that's probably something you probably need to go talk to a doctor about. I don't have any background on that. Sorry about that. Or like a speech... Or maybe, or, a, or maybe a, a vocal coach or, yeah, 
someone someone that that deals with that. I don't deal particularly. I'm dealing more with the tech, <laughs> with the microphones and the mixers and stuff. So, uh, Jason says five pin for stereo or maintain balanced connection for multiple channels. Yeah, that's a good good guess. I think yeah, definitely for stereo, but uh, maintaining balanced connection for multiple channels that's another good guess. Um, but I've seen it even on some of the um, some of the transmitters that don't that are just mono, as far as I'm aware. So they may have some additional things they're doing there as well. That's all we have. So That's all we have. Okay, are we calling it a day already? Can't call it a day already. Give people uh, we'll give people a second. So if you want to put just at Curtis Jet Audio, if you have any questions, love to to get those and take a look at those. Let me go grab the. Um, Nano shield, so I can show it to you at least right now. Um, so give me just a second. Oh, we got a couple more questions. Okay. So after you're doing that. All right. So don't have the cyclone right here to show you a comparison but let me just show this um, ma, 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 ma. disconnect that pop this off okay so here is the shock mount this is the again the short version this is the hc15 so we'll take the foam off there and it comes in the the cover itself is two different pieces it is a honeycomb very lightweight honeycomb like shield it's sort of oval in shape which is a little different as well uh, and then it's covered with this fabric material it's thinner than something you would get on the cyclone and i think what that's going to mean is it's going to be a bit more transparent in terms of how it sounds it won't affect the the timbre of the audio as much and then this slides in on the shock mount there's the back piece Front piece, same thing. Um, honeycomb, you can see just barely inside there. Kind of a honeycomb, and then the sock goes on the outside or the sock-like material. Uh, I'm just gonna slide this on. And then there are two little switches here on either side that help lock that. That's locked now. And now that's locked as well. You'll notice here that the um, I don't know if you can see that or not. <laughs> I'm trying to trick the autofocus, which is a uh, face detect. Um, but there is a high pass filter on the connector here, and this is the XLR output right there on this side. So that is the uh, nano shield right there. Very lightweight, surprisingly lightweight. It's also integrated with their quick release system. So let me pop that out here. Whoops, I just bumped the mic. Apologies for that. Um, so this is the first time I've taken a look at this, too. It's their uh, Rycoat 3 8 inch Boom PCS. PCS standing for Professional Connector System or something like that. I'll need to go take a look at that as well. But this is what you, you screw this end, the 3 8 inch, onto your boom pole. And then it just snaps on like this, which is really nice. You can pop that off that quickly from your boom pole. Very sturdy connection. So we'll do some more looking at that as well here over time. Um, but overall, it looks like the, you know, I'm, I've come to expect now, Rycoat products are not cheap, um, but I've always had good experience with them. They've always held up nicely. It also comes with a little handle here. And this handle also is compatible with the PCS system. So, oh, actually, Oh, I see how it works, okay. So you attach this end to your boom pole and then the PCS pops in here, so. We've got lots of questions now. We've got lots of questions. We'll get back to those in just a second here. So that just pops in like that. And it just pops right back out. And in fact, that's kind of backwards of what we would typically want to do. And so I'd probably configure it something like that. 
So if you're doing handheld uh, sound effects gathering, nice little option there as well. Of course, you do if you do need a little bit more wind immunity, we do have the fur cover as well. And a few other items in the bag here. Which I haven't taken out and worked with yet, but we have different liars. So if you have different diameter microphones, it can adapt to each of those. Um, it looks like there's a replacement swivel joint. We'll need to look into the details on that. And then an additional, I think this is an additional cover for the Nano uh, cover itself. So maybe a thicker material, I'm not positive. This is a black material, the other is a gray. So we'll take a closer look at that. All right, let's bring those questions in. From Mark, hi, we've got a live event production this week and we're using an NTG3 as a crowd mic. Any tips? Um, that should be a fine choice. I would get it. Uh, generally, where you see those when you're using a shotgun microphone, typically those will be mounted up pretty high and pretty well away from the audience so that you can get a nice big swath of the audience to get the, the overall sound of the applause and whatever it else, whatever else is, just, you know, if it's a concert, for example, if they're singing along, things like that, you can mix that in. But generally getting it, getting it well away and up high so you can get a nice... Uh, a nice representation. You want crowd and not individuals. So <laughs> if you get it too close, you're going to get individuals. And I don't think you generally want that. So that's going to be, I think positioning is going to be the number one thing that's going to be the, the interesting challenge. So put your headphones on and have someone move that thing around and see where you can get the best sound on that. Sonoga, how are you inputting music play in your stream? Um, generally, what I do is that the ATEM Mini... Uh, Pro and Extreme have a 3.5 millimeter input. And so I just run a, I've got my phone here. I run, uh, because Apple doesn't believe in 3.5 millimeter jacks anymore on their phones, <laughs> we have the little adapter into a 3.5 millimeter cable and that runs unbalanced into the A10 Mini. So that's how we play back the music when we, for the intro and the outro on this. Pretty simple, straightforward. We don't get too, too fancy on that. Boulder Surfer, will you update us about the ATEM situation when and if you learn more? Yeah, so definitely we'll do that. Um, I want to do some more testing with these when I have the two because I had this the ATEM Mini Pro on hand as a backup in case the primary failed. And yet I'm also using, uh, Danny uses the, the 1ME control panel to control it. Um, so what happened was things got confused on the network. All three of them were connected to the network. And when I went into ATEM software control, I think it was getting mixed up about which ATEM it was using to do the streaming. So I couldn't get it to switch over to the ATEM Mini Pro in the, the period of time I had. Um, so if I want to have the control panel controlling the ATEM Mini Extreme ISO, they both have to be on the network. If I want to instead, if I want to use the encoder from the ATEM Mini Pro, which I have actually sitting over here, um, by feeding the output of the ATEM Mini Extreme via HDMI <laughs> to the input of the ATEM Mini Pro, uh, the software gets all mixed up. So you have to input the key for where you're streaming in the software control. Um, and that's where things got tripped up. So I think if I use the control panel that um, the software is not going to work and therefore I can't stream directly from that. I think that's the, the issue we're having there. <clears throat> what I will probably do next week is that I will probably use the ATEM Mini Pro to do the stream as opposed to the Extreme, um, just to, to switch things up and see if it's a... If, it, if I run into problems with the ATEM Mini Pro as well, then I can probably guess that there's that maybe my router is doing something. Um, nowadays, routers are so sophisticated and complex that it's hard to tell, you know, what all the different settings do. And, you know, I'm not that much of a networking expert, so I know a little bit, but um, it could be something that's going on there. I'm not sure. So far, eight, um, Ecamm Live, from what I can tell, seems to be doing just fine. So it's on the exact same network. This uh, similar type of, um, it's the same stream. It's an RTMP stream to YouTube, so I'm not sure what's going on there. Randy says, what are your thoughts on Aaron 
P being in your studio. Well, <laughs> I thought that was a clever thing that he did and a great way to teach a concept of how to use green screen for backdrops. So for those that are not familiar, Aaron Parecki does a live stream. I think most of you probably already know about his live stream. Um, he does a great job teaching about the A10 Mini and how to do fairly sophisticated things there. I've, I've learned a lot from him. And in fact, this chat that we're using right here is the... He didn't write the initial code, but he took it and packaged it up and made a few changes um, as a Chrome extension plugin or Chrome plugin. Or is it an extension? It's an extension. To, uh, sorry for getting the terminology just right. Um, but he did that. And today he put on a live stream where he got uh, plates of, every, of a bunch of different live streaming studios, including mine, and showed how to uh, do a green screen setup so that you could put yourself in somebody else's studio. So that's what we, that was, I watched the first few minutes and then I was busy getting set up here too, but looked like a lot of fun. Daniel, getting into audio for corporate and interviews, I have one AVX MKE2, but hesitant to invest in another for an ENG setup. Going into a Canon R5 Ninja 5 Plus and considering the Mix Pre 62. Good? Um, yes, good. I, I when, you do, when you're doing ENG news gathering, um, the only hesitation I would have with AVX is that they tend to fall apart. Uh, most of the digital systems I've worked with fall apart pretty quickly outdoors in the wide open spaces. If you don't have walls nearby, they tend to not carry very far. And in fact, I find in some cases you have to put the pack on the front of the person. You can't even hide it on their back, even if you're within, you know, just a couple of meters or a few meters. So I would be careful. And let, I don't know what your experience has been with the AVX so far, but... That's the complaints I've heard. And I know Greg Palmer, years ago, you had an AV. I don't know if you still have an AVX, but you did at one point. And I think you complained about some issues with it outdoors as well. I think you were in a forest and uh, things were not working well. So that's my hesitation. Everything else, absolutely great. No, no hesitation whatsoever on everything else. Um, Hante, a couple, there are I think a couple pieces. What do you think will be the next breakthrough in film audio? I think we're going to see a lot of stuff in post. Um, RX9 came out, uh, just a month ago. There are still plenty of opportunities of things to do better there. So for example, Dialogue Isolate works surprisingly well, but it doesn't catch every situation. I think what they'll say is that they're going to be, it's a, it's basically a machine, I think, from what I understand, it's a machine learning algorithm. So they feed a bunch of different audio samples into it to enable that plugin to differentiate between dialogue, intermittent noise, and ambient sound. And it allows you to control all three of those, which is really cool. And it works surprisingly well. Um, it doesn't work in every situation. We did a test where I had Danny talking into a microphone. I was walking around in the background and there was also a fan running in the background. It was able to differentiate the fan from the dialogue very well. And in between phrases, it was able to take care of the, uh, actually I was sending some uh, mobile alerts as well from a phone. It was able to take care of that in between phrases, but during the talking, it wasn't able to get rid of the, the footsteps very effectively. So I think that the general approach it's going to have to take there is it's going to have to get more aggressive about removing the footsteps or other noise, and then essentially resynthesizing the voice on top of that. And we're not there yet. So I think that's probably one of the big steps we're going to see next in film audio. Uh, Sheriff Logs, do you think Dolby Atmos spatial audio will replace stereo anytime soon? I think it context matters. I think it already basically has in a lot of theaters. Um, well, it's not replaced. The, in, most theaters are already some sort of surround format. Um, I think you're seeing more and well, hopefully if the theaters survive this pandemic, um, that you'll see more and more of them move to Atmos. And I think a lot of the higher end theaters already are. Newer theaters are already at Dolby Atmos. Um, so you're seeing that. In terms of home use, that's where it's more complex. And Dolby Atmos isn't a specification exactly like stereo or even 5171, 111, or, you know, any of those other formats, Dolby Atmos doesn't specify the exact, it, there's a minimum number of speakers you have to have to be Dolby Atmos certified, um, but you can actually scale it up from there as well. And it's pretty, it's pretty complex. And I know there are speakers that you can buy that are evidently Dolby Atmos certified, but 
it's really about the setup and how they're placed in the room. So at home, I think you're like more likely to see spatial audio in headphones. Um, and I think we're already seeing that, but in terms of actual speakers, um, there's a lot more involved there. And I think there are sound bars even call themselves Dolby Atmos. I don't see how that's possible, but maybe I'm missing something and I haven't looked into it super, super close, but I think it's gonna be a while before we see it at home. Um, so those are my thoughts on that and my limited knowledge. Okay, this person also wants to know if there's a video that you've already covered. Okay, does it ha also does it happen that RX does not completely remove the smacking of the language and the dialogues from the audio? How best to deal with this? Are you talking about lip smacks? Um, I, th I assume so, Sergey. Um, it has a it has a mouth declick. Uh, yes, we did actually cover that in my main YouTube channel, so you can go take a look at that over at Curtis Judd and just do a search for Curtis Judd Isotope RX. And it's a it's called it's declicking. I think it just called the video declick. But there are a couple of different declick plugins, and yes, RX is able to do some work on that. But I talk about some of the nuances there. It's not it's not like you can just slap the plugin on and it will automatically do everything. It doesn't do it that well. You still have to go through pretty carefully and identify the the you know the individual smacks and take care of those. All right, Ben's Tech Lab. I bought a DBX two eighty six S, and the high pass filter causes a pretty substantially asymmetrical waveform which influ influences loudness before clipping. Are there better, worse high pass filters? Um, I wouldn't say they're better or worse, but there are there is a, an important difference. There are phase linear um, EQs and high pass filters, and there are others that are not phase linear. And so if it's phase linear, it should not affect that the waveform in terms of making it asymmetric. Um, but those that are analog a lot of times will do that. So that's pretty normal. Um, so if you are looking for something that doesn't do that, you're going to want to look for something that's a phase linear EQ or high pass. And a lot of EQs do that in software, certainly. But anyway, I'm going from a DBX-286S to Rolls Pro Match to ATEM Mini, disabling EQ and dynamics in the ATEM. You might actually try the EQ, uh, create that, use the high pass in the ATEM instead and see if that gets you closer to where you need to be. That's what I would try. You're going to be post, I know you're going to be post um, digital conversion, but um, still it'll take care of any of that, whatever low frequency stuff is, is still left there. So not ideal, but could work. I would, that's what I would try. Uh, Mark, comparing the Rycoats or any others, why the difference in the shotgun mic lengths? Are they for specific uses or advantages? Yeah, I think um, usually a longer shotgun microphone design can essentially has a smaller pickup pattern. In other words, it's more focused. Um, so if you need more reach, um, what it does is it takes, you know, instead of at maybe at four feet, the polar pattern is picking up this kind of range in terms of a, a bubble. <laughs> Um, for a longer shotgun microphone, it might be a smaller one, and that means it's going to pick up less ambient noise. So that's the main difference in the shotgun lengths. Also, it, um, sometimes the rear rejection is quite a bit different as well, depending on the design of the microphone. Um, I don't know if length is as much of a factor there, but that's the main thing that I've noticed with the factor uh, the factor of length. Um, the longer shotgun microphones, which are, you know, 60 centimeters in length, um, or 50 centimeters in length or 40 centimeters in length. Those typically are used for when you need a lot of reach. And again, that's when you're gonna, the subject's going to be farther away and you just need essentially at the same distance, it's going to have a smaller um, space that it picks up sound from. So you have to get aim just right, um, but you do have that, that additional reach. Okay, we have two from two different people, but they're related. Okay. Two related questions. Hante, have started to try the Shure Axiant system. Did you get a full system for review yet? Okay, and then here's the other one. Mm -hmm. And the second one, AVX for now or save for Axiant? Okay, two related questions. So I am still, um, yeah, still waiting for Shure to send over a different backplate so I can upgrade the firmware so that I can test it. It's not going to be, I'm not doing a full Axiant review because I don't have all of the Axiant system to test. Um, but I will, you know, I'll test what I can here. The, mo the, the main purpose of this whole thing is to test the Duraplex microphones. <laughs> um, but I'll have some things to say about Axiant as well, I'm sure. 
Um, and then Daniel's question is, should I go with an AVX for now or save for the Axiant? I, that's a tough question. Um, I mean, if you've got the cash for Axiant, I think that's one of those things you can probably buy and not regret. Um, is it overkill for what you're doing? I don't know. I don't know what you're doing exactly. It sounds like news gathering and um, that's a pretty expensive system. But it's a, it's from what I've seen so far, it's a really good system. So I, I would just, the, my only reservation is AVX tends to struggle a little bit more outdoors. So I, I would test out that one channel of AVX you have so far, do some outdoor tests and see how you go. And if it's giving you any trouble and you're not happy with its performance, then you can make that decision on whether or not to go to, for Axiant or something else. Um, I use Audio Limited, so there are plenty of other systems out there too. Sure has some less expensive systems, UHF systems as well. Um, if you're operating, I don't know, if you're doing news gathering, I'm assuming you're operating from a bag. So I think a lot of the Sure systems, the receivers are actually rack mount. So Axiant would be the first one that they have in a while, at least that is a, a bag style receiver. Um, other options, uh, there's always Electrosonics, um, and they have some great systems. There is Wizicom. There's, if you're, I don't know if you're using a Zaxcom mixer. If you are, Zaxcom makes some great wire, wireless as well. So those are the, thir the, the options I'd take a look at. We have lots and lots of questions. <laughs> since we have time for what your opinion, um, since we have time, what's your opinion of the new Aperture AMRAM P60C and P60X lights? Got two P60C ins, and so far I'm really impressed. Uh, Matt, they are in the process of sending some to me, so I haven't tested them yet, but um, I haven't been terribly disappointed with any of the Aperture stuff. Uh, I, most of it's actually quite good for my purposes, so I'm expecting something similar there. I think it's really going to depend on how much, what you're lighting and how much light output you need. That's really what it's going to come down to. P60C for talking head should be great. Oh, and the P60X. Um, Sangman. Hey, Curtis, can you mention key points for learning about audio? Like a graded way to go on to learn about audio. I have been taking in random infos, so sometimes not so great. Thanks in advance. Um, well, there are a lot of different approaches you can take. I think practice, practice, practice is the biggest. You need to get experience with it. Ex find what issues you're running into and then solve those issues. That's a, that's a good way to do it. If there's any possibility, if you can go and um, find someone who is a working engineer, audio engineer or mixer, go and help them. Go and offer to, um, you know, run go get their coffee or <laughs> go get some extra cables out of the van or uh, run and do little things for them. So if you can find a way to do that, they can teach you a lot and they can teach you the basics, um, potentially. I have some courses online. The Production Sound Fundamentals course would be a pretty good one to start with because we talk about a lot of really basic things there. Um, so those are some things to think about. I do have some kind of interview or uh, I have some kind of basics um, videos on the on the Curtis Judd channel as well. So a lot of things like microphone placement is huge. And I think a lot of people don't learn that until later. It's it's you need to get the microphone reasonably close. There aren't it's like they're not magic. Like people assume that we have these uh, mobile phones, which can do all these sort of magical things. Um, if you want really good sound, you have to place the microphone optimally. And that means usually closer than certainly not on top of your camera. Um, three meters away. If it's three meters away, it's going to sound like it's three meters away. It's going to pick up a whole bunch of ambient noise. So getting the microphone close, understanding what what a balanced cable does for you. A lot of people just assume that an XLR output and an XLR cable gives you better audio. Well, not in and of itself. What it does is it provides some immunity to radio frequency and electromagnetic interference. That's what a balanced cable does. So it allows you to run a longer cable with less risk of picking those things up. So that, that's another basic, th you know, those kind of basic things to learn. Um, so hopefully that gives you a little bit of guidance. If you have more specific questions, love to hear those as well. Greg, regarding the NTG3 for a live event, think about the rear lobe and be sure it's not pointing at a speaker or air conditioning vent. That is a great point. Um, so any shotgun microphone will also pick up from the back and the NTG3 is no exception to that. So make sure that's not aiming at something that's noise that you don't want to pick up. 
It's a great point. Camerahead Studios, what do you think about the Comica Audio Boom X U1 U1 compact wireless microphone system, 568 to 579 megahertz? I have not used it. Um, yeah, just haven't used it, so I don't have an opinion. I apologize. We kind of covered this. Uh, do you use a web presenter for streaming? Maybe to have more options in case of some switching between ATEMs. Um, I don't, um, and I'm actually I might consider that. Although <laughs> my confidence, I've I've worked with Black Magic products for a while now, and I love their products. But I have to confess something: they are not the most reliable. Um, they are really competing on price in a lot of time, a lot of times, and sometimes, like my brother had, we, we both had the Black Magic Ursa Mini Pro, the cinema camera. My, the, the color calibrate the color between them was completely different. We, we used the exact same lens, shot the exact same uh, spot, and they did not look the same at all. I mean, it was a striking difference, enormous difference. We also, um, I never had any issues with mine in terms of like hardware issues, but Carrie, my brother had, I think he had, he had three or four of them before he finally sold his. Um, with all different sorts of technical issues. The biggest issue he had was that the, the little LCD screen failed multiple times, um, at least twice. So anyway, some pretty pretty rough stuff. Now I'm having this issue here. I don't know if it's a hardware issue yet or not with the ATEM minis. Um, I haven't, I you know, I put a question out on Twitter. I didn't hear back from anybody. Nobody said that they were having the same problem. So it could be something on my end. Again, it could be my router or something on the network that I'm running into, not positive yet. Um, but web presenter, I would definitely consider that as a possibility. But I want to get, kind of get to the bottom of this issue first and see what's going on. So I don't think it's the network, though, because Ecamm Live is working fine. So uh, Trevor says, it's like a pub crawl of YouTubers here today. Just came from Aaron Parecki's live stream to Curtis's live stream. Which bar do we hit after this one? <laughs> I don't know. Who's up next? I know Rob Christiansen, if you're into movie reviews, he's got one later today, I think. Um, so that's worth taking a look at. Greg. I heard a rumor that Curtis gives away microphones for Halloween. Just saying, that's what I heard. Um, none to give away just yet. Uh, <laughs> but thanks, Greg. Kevin, it's great to hear you here. Cur Curtis's courses are excellent. Highly recommend. Done them all. Thank you, Kevin. I very much appreciate that. It's good to see you. Um, Linda, I need a course on radio frequency. Any suggestions? No, I wish I did have a suggestion. I was working with Michael Wynn to put one together, and uh, alas, um, he's gotten so busy with his, his mixing jobs that we had to abandon that, sadly. Um, and I don't have any other suggestions right now. I know, I believe Electrosonics has some, they're not full-blown courses, but they have some stuff on their YouTube channel. Uh, early in, I think it was in 2020, they put together uh, like a mini, basically a series of videos where they talked about radio frequency. That was useful. Um, I think Sure has some things as well, um, but I think there's a there's definitely a need for wireless microphone, a um, wireless microphone course of some sort. And um, I wish I had time to put it together myself. Also, I saw Miguel Amasquita out there. I just wanted to say hi to Miguel. All right. Any other questions? Tons, but tons. We're, we're out of time now. I'm so sorry. Uh, we're gonna <laughs> we're gonna have to wrap it for this week. Thanks everyone for joining us. Get out there and make some great sound, and we'll talk to you again next week.